Okay, so come to the next, welcome to the next class, uh, which will be a discussion of the virial theorem. And thereafter, we are going to reach the expression for the stress tensor from which the microscopic pressure is calculated when in the presence of forces, in the presence of interaction. Uh, so the virial theorem is a pretty important theorem. Uh, you have seen the uh, the derivation of the equipartition theorem from statistical mechanics. And equipartition theorem essentially mentions about uh, the relation of the mean kinetic energy per molecule and how is it related to the KBT, the thermal energy, All right? Uh, the question is, is there any su similar such expression uh, where the potential energy or the force comes in? And that's the viral theorem. Uh, now, in Rife, there isn't an article or a section on the viral theorem. On all of the books, including Karda, Patria, um, Huang, there are. Uh, there are uh, but in some of the books, uh, they are done in the microcanonical ensemble. I find the discussion in the canonical, the discussion of the virial theorem in the canonical ensemble to be more appropriate uh, or easy, easy to understand, easy to uh, realize. So whatever I'm saying is essentially from uh, this, from this, uh, Control and yeah, uh, from this site www.pass.rochester.edu.stte uh, and so on so forth. You can just give a search of real theorem and Rochester and you'll get this. Uh, moreover, uh, the extension from virial theorem to stress tensor is discussed well in DH's Psi, the Confess. 1979, uh, but there's a problem, there's a small error, I um, mean, error in terms of the convention uh, that I should tell when we discuss the topic. Uh, with that, uh, what we are going to do is uh, for a classical system described by a Hamiltonian. So, necessarily, uh, we are discussing only those systems which are described, which uh, whose equations of motion can be written in terms of a Hamiltonian we are going to calculate this quantity uh, xi into del x del x j and the expectation value of that uh, so just to explain what uh, xi and xj are xi can be any one of either the position coordinate or the momentum coordinates right so the, so it could be any one of the Six n variables, and similarly, x j can be any one of the six j variables. So, for example, this could be uh, the x momentum of the fifth particle. I would be, uh, I would be the uh, yeah. So, it's the fifth particle, the x momentum, and this could be, for example, uh, the position of the ninth particle. And if you take such an expectation value, which for the theory, we will do it in the canonical ensemble picture, but uh, correspondingly, experimentally or computationally, if you can, if you can uh, take the time average of such a quantity, right, uh, then will show that it has a nice relation to KBT. So that, that, that's where we are heading. And that uh, expression will have some consequences in terms of writing down the pressure tensor. That's where we are heading. But uh, here at the moment, without giving any reason, so, uh, so Xi is one of the six n-dimensional dim coordinates. And uh, Xi could be equal to Xj also. I mean, uh, I mean, this J could be equal to I. So then it would be Pxi of the fifth particle and the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the uh, x coordinate of the fifth particle c just as an example right so 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 we are going to calculate this quantity and take an ensemble canonical ensemble average over all possible degrees of freedom 
and uh, to calculate this thermodynamic average so any quantity uh, you basically uh, take the particular microstate a microstate will be defined by a set of particular values of q and p and we're going to integrate over all values of dq and dp corresponding to all possible accessible microstates and we're going to multiply it by the product uh, sorry, uh, by the probability of accessing the microstate, which is e to the power minus beta uh, h energy uh, divided by the partition function. Right? So that's what we have written there. So all six n coordinates. So, so here q again uh, represents a three-dimensional vector, and p here represents a three-dimensional vector, and x i could be any of these variables. Uh, it, it one is bh and this is the partition function. So this is what I have written already and ex, uh, explained that. And now uh, this quantity xi del, del h, h being the Hamiltonian del xj, uh, can be written as uh, del, del xj of e to the power minus beta h. And why is that? Because, okay, into minus one by beta. Uh, because if we take a derivative with uh, rest uh, with respect to xj, yes, a minus beta will uh, will uh, basically um, it will sit in the numerator and to cancel that so you have this minus beta and then um, and then uh, h itself has to be uh, um, by the chain rule you will get del h del xj. Right, so we have just rewritten this in uh, this form. And the z is intact as usual. Uh, then all that we do is integration with respect to only one of the coordinates uh, that is with respect to xj. So this we integrate with respect to xj and keep the rest of the six and minus one coordinates intact. So what we have is this minus, uh, no, so you have this z here sitting here, the minus one by beta sitting here and within brackets, uh, basically xi is the first term and this this one, this is the second term when we're doing integration by parts. So this del q del p is an integration over six and minus one coordinates to remind you I have given a dash and we're actually integrating over the xj coordinate. So this, is remains here and then you integrate del del xj into dxj. So the integral becomes db e to the power, uh, so d e to the power minus beta h, right? Minus, minus uh, derivative del del xi del xj because, because we are integrating with respect to xj. And then this thing becomes again, so the this is the second term, it, it is this term to xj into del x dash j, right? And this dxj remains. So basically what you do is take a differentiation of this first and an integral, uh, a, a dummy integral. It's a function of uh, zero to xj essentially. Uh, so you take uh, integral like this. Uh, so that's all that you do, right? So now, I'll show that this term essentially becomes equal to zero when you put the limits of xj, right? Which is, will be minus infinity to plus in, uh, infinity or uh, we'll discuss wherever we put the limits because this is contained in a finite volume. So, so this is the limits will be the values of xj at the boundary. So this will term going to zero and here this minus and this minus will give a plus. So what we have is, uh, so what we have is, uh, I think this minus, yeah, the minus is still here. Yes, and here you get a plus, but this term will essentially will be equal to zero. So I have written six and minus one coordinates, a dash just to remind you of that. And you still have this dxj along with the six and minus one coordinates, right? So this dl xj, so hence that here 
dq dp is without the dash this is integral over 6 n coordinates we're going to discuss this later because this is the term that survives this term will go to zero and the question is why will it go to zero so uh, so what i have done is uh, um, just the term which is integrated by parts xj into it though when it's beta h xj one limit to the other limit and the maximum values or the minimum and the maximum values of xj which are possible now now suppose xj was momenta momenta of a particle uh, Right, and there's a canonical ensemble. In principle, each of the momenta, each degree of freedom can go from minus infinity to plus infinity. So Pj, so in that case, Xj will be equal to Pj, a particular coordinate, and it will be minus infinity and plus infinity, right? And if momentum is infinity, then e to the power minus beta h, h will have p square by 2m. And even if one of the coordinates is infinity, p square, infinity square, so basically e to the power minus beta h will be equal to zero. So that's what I've written, e to the power uh, whatever plus, uh, I mean, it will be basically p square by 2m. So even if it is minus infinity or plus infinity, it doesn't really matter. Uh, e to the power minus beta h. Uh, so basically, yeah, so this will be e to the power minus infinity, right? Uh, this is 1 upon e to the power infinity. This means equal to 0. On the other hand, if xj was uh, spatial coordinates, any of the spatial uh, coordinates, the limit of xj 1 and 2 will be at the walls. It will be the upper uh, end of the walls. So whatever values it can take. And if uh, this particle has a position which is absolutely close uh, on the walls, then the VR, because it's confined, because there's a finite uh, volume to it. And so that, uh, so basically the way you confine is uh, at a certain value of position coordinates, you have practically infinite walls. And uh, at that point, uh, VR will be equal to infinity as a consequence of which the Hamiltonian, uh, so so the Hamiltonian will go to infinity and e to the minus beta h again will be equal to zero. Now suppose you say that, okay, I'm going to can, uh, basically do a practically infinite system. We are really looking at the bulk. We don't have any walls and so on and so forth. So the way you handle it theoretically is uh, using a periodic boundary condition. Right, and if it's a periodic boundary condition, then the two limits of the box by default, by definition, uh, they are the same. So xj will be xj at position one, the minimum will be the same value at xj at two. And again, so these two quad the value of the two limits, these two values will be the same, which will lead to the cancellation of this term. So this term, uh, with this minus this term, substitute. Uh, this is substituted, the two values are equal, and again, it is equal to zero. So what is the message? The term that survives is this one. And let's look at the consequence of that. So only the second term survives, uh, survives. but uh, in the second term, what you have is del xi del xj, and that is nothing but equal to delta ij, the chronic delta function. Uh, yeah, because... Uh, yeah, because these are two independent coordinates. So only if uh, both i and j are the same, uh, will you ha have a derivative as it's with independent variables it's equal to zero. The consequence of which is xi del h del xj can be written as one by beta six n coordinates integration over six n coordinates. Here it was six n coordinates because there was a dxj sitting here. And then you combine it with these, and you have six n coordinates. So six n coordinates uh, del x i del x j uh, into e to the power minus beta h, and you should be having a partition function here. The partition function here I've forgotten to put. Uh, they should be uh, divided by z, 
But once you do that, I mean, here I have put the partition function, but in this expression I've forgotten, I'm extremely sorry. Uh, so, but what you have is one by beta delta ij, right? And del q del p over six n coordinates e to the minus beta h, and the z gives del q del p e to the minus beta h. So the term on the numerator and the denominator cancels. So what you have is xi del h del xj delta ij so and when you take an ensemble average the value which will survive on ensemble average or time average if you like because we're doing equilibrium statistical physics unless xi and xj are same uh, the value will be zero but if they are the same then you will have the value kbt on taking the thermodynamic average and this is the so-called virial theorem right a special case when you take xi uh, to be suppose pi and then xj also has to be pi del h del pi uh, that is uh, so you take an ensemble average or a time average so at different points in time you take the moment of a particle calculate del h del pi but what is del h del pi if it's an hamiltonian system del h del pi is equal to minus q dot the velocity velocity of a particular uh, degree of freedom. So the momentum into the velocity thermodynamic average is equal to kbt. And if you realize this thing can be written as pi by m and then it's p square by m that's equal to kbt and pi square by 2m is the kinetic, uh, is the kinetic energy mean kinetic energy expectation value is important I've repeated many times that is equal to half kbt. So this is the same as equipartition theorem. So this is another form of the equipartition theorem. This is a special case of the virial theorem with uh, pi xi going as pi, right? On the other hand, and this is the more interesting case, uh, if you take uh, one of the variables to be uh, now, so suppose xi is one of the position variables qi, you could take x coordinate of the fifth particle and a derivative with respect to the x coordinate of the fifth particle because else uh, there's a delta ij sitting here. So qi into del h del qi. But this quantity del h del qi is nothing but the force p dot, right? md2, yeah, md2 r dt2 equal to force. Uh, it's just the force. So this and it comes to the minus sign it's like yeah minus qipi and when you take the thermodynamic average you get equal to kbt and this is for each degree of freedom any degree of freedom take the position multiply it by the corresponding component of the force acting on it take an ensemble average with a minus sign and that's equal to kbt and it's pretty strange, right? Because particles, when they're interacting, they can move around, they can rearrange themselves in various manners. But if you take a thermodynamic average of the position into the force, the right components equal, I mean, this is I and this is I. So minus X1, the position of the first particle over time or ensemble average, into the force acting on the same particle, the x component uh, uh, of force on the same particle, time average or an ensemble average with a minus sign is equal to kbt. Now, this quantity, okay, so this is the equipartition co uh, quantity basically. This now, if you sum over all. The particles i equal to 1 to 3n then take an ensemble average it's the sum of the individual ensemble averages and that is equal to 3n kbt right so it will be equal to 3n kbt where q dot equal to pi by m but as i said the more interesting quantity because you've seen this you know what is the partition theorem but the more interesting quantity is i equal to 1 to 3n qi into p dot the position into the force xi fi now, what we're going to do is write the same expression uh, in a slightly different manner, uh, in which suppose, uh, suppose there's a finite range force, but it will hold for infinite range forces as well. 
So what I'm going to do with this summation, I'm writing it explicitly. So this is the uh, position of the first particle, right? So here we're just rewriting this expression and later this ensemble average will come back. So we are just rewriting this. The position of the first particle, the suppose it is interacting with P1 variable, uh, P1 neighbors. Okay, or you could say that M1 neighbor, I mean, not M is a mark. So let's say uh, there are, uh, I don't know, uh, Q1, uh, no, Q is also not good, but let's suppose there are D1 neighbors, yeah, N neighbors. So suppose there are N neighbors, well, N capital N is the number of particles in the system. Uh, some variable, so suppose P1 neighbors, so x1 equal to, so all that I've written is written this force in terms of the gradient of a potential. Uh, and uh, the force acting on the second particle is sum over j. So this is a derivative with respect. Okay, so what is this? So this is 1j, 2j, right? So let's look at this. So this is basically a force acting on So uh, just to get a clear idea of what we are taking a derivative uh, with uh, respect to, we are taking a derivative of, what are we taking a derivative of? What is this variable to calculate the force? So the point is just imagine that this is a coordinate system. This is the origin, one particle is the first particle is located at r1 vector second particle is located at r2 vector and then we can say that r1 vector plus r vector r is this the vector pointing from 1 to 2 right this is the uh, uh, this is the r vector so r vector can be written as r2 minus r1 this I'm writing as R21. And remember this vector, R21 vector or R vector is pointing from 1 to 2. Right. Now, so, so when we are taking a derivative, so, so these, these are potential, this is in general the potential uh, between 1 and j, suppose. Um, okay, so there's a potential. Uh, it's a general potential, but now you're taking a derivative with respect to 1 uh, and j. So then, uh, yeah, this is the force acting on the first particle. Yeah. So 1, sorry, 2, 1. The force was pointing. So this vector points on to right so from one to two okay it will also depend upon uh so assuming that this quantity is positive and there's a minus sign sitting here so remember that so 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 basically you uh, take so this is essentially it's a del phi del x not the force minus del phi del x is basically uh yeah, so this quantity is acting in this manner. It's the force acting on one, uh, except that minus uh, delta del x is the force. So, so you have three and such terms where this summation is the neighbor of each particle. And this is the position of each particle. Actually, there are three n, so x1, x2, x3, up till three n terms. And then uh, it can also be, so this I have written down as J P1 as the force acting on I due to J, summation over J, and so on and so forth, right? And there will be three in terms. Now, this can be rewritten. Remember the force acting on each particle is equal and opposite. So if we consider, in, so Fij will be equal to minus Fj, Gi. 
but in front of each term you have also the local at that instant coordinate of these each of these particles and if we take that into account remember here there were three n terms and here there are only n terms so the three variables x y z m quad i am combining into r i minus r g right so this would co correspond to x1 into f uh, 1 j some of our all neighbors so if you just think i mean i'm just combining all the terms where it has the same fij value except comes with a minus sign so it's r i minus r j dot f i j r is a three dimensional vector the sum is i equal to 1 to n and you're counting only if j is equal to less than one uh, less than i that's to avoid over counting so every pair you are counting only once that is the basic message when you are writing r i minus r j into f i j or else if you want to allow double counting you have to add and half here and then i can vary from 1 to n and j can vary from 1 to n right so each pair will be double counted but then i and j cannot be equal obviously or that will give zero or you can uh, but it will give r i minus r j equal to zero so and the force will be weird a particle cannot give force on itself so so i cannot be equal to j uh, if you want to have both uh, i runs from 1 to n, then uh, to avoid uh, over counting, counting, you have to put a half term. So this is what you get. So this has been written as i equal to 1 to n, j is less than i, rij, fij is what uh, the virial and summing over all can be done. Now, if you take the expectation average, which is the same as taking the expectation, so this is the virial expression, this has been re rewritten like this, i, comma, j, no over counting, reminding you of this, and if you want over counting, then you have to put a half uh, double counting, and that will be equal to 3 kbtn, and that's in equilibrium. So that's the virial expression can be rewritten in this form and that is equal to 3 kbtn. Now I want to explain to you that this term is really an expression of the stress term. Uh, right? Now th th this equal to kbt e n, uh, kbt n, n is the number of particles three times. Uh, th this relation will hold in equilibrium but this quantity in general I mean, without the expectation value, that is related to the virial stress. It's the expression for the microscopic stress term. Let, let me explain that in the next slide. Uh, so what I have written is in equilibrium or in non-equilibrium, it really doesn't matter. Uh, in general, uh, the amount of momentum transport through any surface is by two methods what we have discussed in the Boltzmann transport uh, equation classes that if there is a surface say right so this is a surface and suppose this is z direction and if x component if x co so because a particle goes from here to there and because the particle goes from here to there it also had some x momentum so some x momentum is transferred as a con consequence of a more of a particle moving from here to there. So that's the momentum transfer across this surface. And if that happens for unit time, that will give you an idea of the force. Momentum transport per unit time, change of momentum per unit time, per unit area is an expression of the pressure, if you like. But on the other hand, if this surface itself was moving, in this direction or the, this direction really doesn't matter. Uh, so then the fluctuations, the fluctuations about the mean velocity will contribute uh, to the microscopic stress or pressure of the system. And that's what it is written here. So basically sigma, the stress tensor, alpha, beta in two directions and it alpha and beta could also be x and x. 
but uh, in general, uh, alpha and beta could be different, like x y sigma x y. The sigma x y would co correspond to the transport of momentum x momentum across uh, in the y direction. That right per unit time per unit area. Uh, so that 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 would be, so and that. Uh, can be written as 1 by V per unit volume, if you like, minus Mi, the mass of individual particles, uh, the X component of velocity of the ith particle, so this is the ith particle, I, right, minus V alpha X, if the whole fluid element was moving with respect to some average velocity, so you're really looking at the fluctuations, of suppose the x, so this the m into this is the momenta, right? X momenta say transported in the y direction per unit time, right? Of course, in equilibrium, these quantities v alpha expectation and v beta expectation would be equal to zero. So this would be m i v alpha i into v i beta i, right? So that would contribute to some stress. But uh, if you take the expectation value, because this is a microscopic expression, if the system was in equilibrium, sigma x y or sigma y x would be equal to zero. So sigma x z, sigma y x. So all the off diagonal terms when x and z, when the two things are not the same, they would be zero. Why would they be zero? Because the number of particles moving from uh, in, in unit time from here to here, and vice versa. So the net transport of momenta will be uh, uh, basically the same. So there will be no net transport of momenta, and hence that will be equal to zero. So sigma x y equal to sigma y x, uh, sigma z y will be equal to uh, zero. But that's only in equilibrium. However, if there's a net uh, transfer of momenta, it will have a certain finite value. And this is by particles explicitly moving from one region to the other. Right in in general, you would also have oh, suppose there are some particles. Uh, so let's let's suppose this is some surface. This is some surface. This is the y direction. This is the x direction. This is the z direction. Now you could also ask, what is the stress or what is the force? So what are the units of stress? So stress so stress is force per unit area. Force is momentum change per unit time, right? Now, if you multiply force into displacement and on the, that's an unit of energy. And on the, on the denominator also you ask, you add a delta Y say, so that's something like energy per unit volume. So stress, force per unit area also has the same dimensions of energy per unit volume, right? But you're wanting to calculate sigma y say, the force acting across the plane. Uh, and you could have x component of force, y component. So the plane is in the y, uh, the, the normal to the plane is in the y direction. And you are asking how much across the plane is how much force is acting in the x direction, in the y direction, and in the z direction across the plane, right? Now, suppose there was some particle here and some particle here. And of course, this is just one particle there, but there could be tons of particles here, right? So this particle is interacting with the ith particle, uh, this direction. So if you're asking about normal to the plane, this is suppose y, and then uh, across this plane, this particle is giving some force in the x direction, in the y direction, and also in the z direction. Right? That's possible, right? If they're displaced, if they are like not in the thing, right? So, so the stress acting on y, the sigma x y would be. So 
So it will be the X component of the force acting across the Y plane. Sigma XZ would be the Z component of the force acting along across the Y plane. Sigma YY will be the Y component of the force acting across the Y, I mean, the plane which lies at a particular Y, uh, yeah, whose normal is uh, whose normal is in the y, y hat direction, right? So that would be the stress. And of course, uh, to get to match with experiments, you have to take a and either an ensemble average or a time average. I mean, if you are if it's a non-equilibrium, you have to take a time average, of course. And there could be many particles, hence this the total stress will be the sum over all the particles which are on one side, sum over j. So j has to be on this side, the j region, and sum of i has to be in this region. So of all the pairs where j and i are interacting with each other, right? So to take all possible pairs uh, where one of the particles is on the j region, the other particle is in the i region, and if you sum over all the interactions, in different directions across the y plane, then you'll get sigma xy, right? And this I already explained the momentum flux in time t. Momentum flux means per unit area in time t that would also contribute to the st stress, right? Now, so this is the virial expression, which can be written like this is the stress term, right? Uh, so, so, so this is this is the expression for stress for the reasons that I explained to you, and uh, the yeah. So this came with a minus sign. So if you absorb the minus sign here, so R J I dot F I J, right? So then the direction will be reversed. So R J I. If you absorb this minus here, so that will be Rgi into Fij. And that is the same expression as this stress term. So this half is basically a sum over all i and j, except when i is not equal to j. Uh, it's basically no overcounting. You could also write it uh, in this manner. So there's nothing which prevents you. Uh, the, so all this is very well explained in the Psi paper. But you have to keep in mind that the pressure, the pressure tensor, so in equilibrium, when pressure is defined, that is defined as minus one third sigma xx, sigma yy, sigma zz, whereas inside they don't, in this paper, which I wrote, they don't have the minus sign. If you don't have the minus sign, you won't have the right definition of pressure, where pressure is basically pushing against the wall and uh, I mean, you know, P into V equal to PV. Uh, so you can, from here, you can also get equal to PV equal to not RT plus correction terms because there will be interaction. So depending upon the nature of the interaction, if it's an attractive interaction, right? So, so, so the pressure will be less if the, if the forces are pointing outwards, so repulsive, there will be an extra uh, pressure contribution over and above the this term right because yeah you can just work it out what will be the direction so it's xj minus xi so if it's sigma xx so this will be both will be x uh, sorry alpha will be both will be x and yeah i mean you can just calculate that when it is attractive, when it is repulsive, how will the stress tensor be and what will be the corresponding uh, pressure. And it will make sense uh, whether it's attractive, repulsive, pressure will be over and above the ideal gas pressure. It will either be a bit collapsive or repulsive. Of course, in equilibrium, there will be a balance, right? The, the particles are moving, they are hitting against each other. Uh, this velocity itself will be changing. 
as they move in the potential some of them will be ex uh, repulsive some will be attractive so it will be balanced out once it reaches equilibrium uh, but this is the pressure term and the hydrostatic conditions and in equilibrium co uh, conditions you will have finite values of sigma x x sigma y y and sigma z z and they will all be equal uh, and the off diagonal terms will be zero in equilibrium under hydrostatic conditions but if the system is in non-equilibrium uh, if there is flow uh, a momentum transport between different layers of the fluid uh, then these terms like if a system is in flow then these will be non-zero so the point is that the video theorem uh, itself this term is related to kbt in and uh, equilibrium and this expression so which this this relation holds only in equilibrium but otherwise, this is the expression of the stress tensor, and this term is called the virial stress. One by V a uh, half summation over all pairs. This term is called the virial contribution to stress. So this is the basic message. Other topics will start and go on from the expression of the virial stresses. Papers are still being written, but that is where I shall end the class.